October of 2010, at CARE, we start to draw the very important and explicit connections between the war on drugs and the war on terror, at least in, in the Ninth Circuit. There is nothing that we could have done in the Ninth Circuit in October of 2010 about this GPS tracking device for which we believe there was no warrant. We filed a Freedom of Information Act request in Yasu's name to get a copy of the FBI's file on him. And what it turned up was copies of a lot of the media coverage of the GPS tracking device story, which is frightening because law enforcement is prohibited by the Privacy Act from keeping records of your First Amendment activities. But what it also turned up was those initial conversations that they had internally about, oh no, the device has been compromised, we must go in and retrieve it. So that's the first step. The second step is, again, what do we do? What is his recourse? And in the Ninth Circuit at that time, there was no recourse. And this is where the connection is very clear. The Ninth Circuit in 2010 had decided the case um, on behalf of a man named um, Juan Pineda Moreno. Pineda Moreno was accused, or was suspected, of buying materials and tools, remember I know nothing about this, buying materials and tools to, to, to manufacture marijuana. And a GPS tracking device was placed on his car. And he was tailed for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then charged with various drug offenses. In his case, the court found that there was no violation of his Fourth Amendment rights by the placement of the tracking device on his car. The court went so far as to say that even when law enforcement walks into your driveway and places a tracking device on your car, there is no violation of your privacy rights. And so for the Amemsa community, for the Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian community, where we weren't making this connection to the war on drugs, it became very apparent, very clear, and very quickly that the very violations of civil liberties that were occurring under the war on drugs were now directly impacting us on the war on terror. And it goes back to a lot of what Manami spoke about in terms of why weren't we making these connections? Why weren't we building this power collectively, right? Someone said yesterday that so often, as minority groups, we're not speaking to each other, and yet we expect everybody to listen to us. And so here we were, having been silent as an entire community on the war on drugs and the related erosion of civil liberties for decades. And we had now thought, oh no, this has come home. Because it wasn't as though the civil liberties that were eroded as a result of the war on drugs had come back when the war on drugs started to die off, which it hasn't. It was that they set the groundwork for our erosion of civil liberties. Some really quick just timeline points on the war on drugs to give you an indication of why it's so frightening that this has been going on so long. The US government, the federal government, has been talking about drugs for nearly a century now. The war on drugs was, began with the Harrison Act, Tax Act in 1914, which restricted the sale of heroin, and was quickly used to restrict the sale of cocaine as well. But it was officially declared in 1971. Nixon called drugs public enemy number one. The DEA was created in 1973 and used to really crack down federally on the use of drugs. And there's all sorts of countries that we went into looking to protect ourselves from drugs. And it's interesting that we are, we're now going into Afghanistan and Iraq and possibly Iran to protect ourselves from terror. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was Mexico, Colombia, um, and really any country in South America where there, we had an economic interest. We were there looking for ways to, to catch the drug dealers. Andy Singer, who's one of these cartoonists, put, up a, a, put out a cartoon talking about the comparisons between the war on drugs and the war on terror. In both the war on drugs and the war on terror, we're invading poor countries to get the criminals, sometimes the terrorists and sometimes the drug dealers. We're destroying homes, confiscating property, and jailing families to get the suspects. We accidentally kill and imprison thousands of innocent people. We ignore the underlying causes. We waste billions and billions of dollars, and we experience failure. So in the war on drugs timeline, another thing that's really sort of frightening and, and I think highlights for us the need to, to draw these connections is the <coughs> emphasis on the US-Mexico border, right? Marijuana is a drug that we all believe comes from Mexico. And so the solution to it is to militarize the border, to clamp down really, really hard on the, on the border. In 1993, NAFTA was signed, which is interesting because it has all sorts of economic consequences for people who are working on social justice, but also really increases trade on the border. Comparing now that administration and the administration that we're currently in, because I think quite often we believe that we should 
derive hope from the Obama administration, and I think that's incorrect. Biden, the current vice president, is responsible for the Violent Crime and Control Law Enforcement Act of 1994, which many argue set the stage for the Patriot Act. It allocated more money to build prisons and set up boot camps for delinquent minors. It designated 50 new federal offenses, including gang membership, several new federal death penalty offenses, including murders related to drug dealing, drive-by shooting murders, civil rights-related murders, murders of federal law enforcement officers, and death caused by acts of terrorism or weapons of mass destruction. The law was passed in 1994, and many believe that the civil liberties erosions that occurred under it are what set the groundwork for the USA Patriot Act. Fast forward to 2009, and the Obama administration is now considered not should we end the war on drugs, not should we vindicate the, the many innocent people that were targeted, but rather should we rename the war on drugs. And this is the problem. You can't declare war on inanimate objects, social phenomena, moods, or abstractions, because similar to the war on terror, that is what fuels the fact that it continues to move forward, because there is no end in sight. How do you define success when you can't even see the quote unquote enemy? I mentioned in 2001 the USA Patriot Act was signed, and I think that a lot of times we focus on the Patriot Act, but we don't talk about the related civil liberties erosions that happened as a result, whether it was warrantless wiretapping, GPS tracking, um, electronic surveillance of phone conversations, and the disproportionate targeting of people of color. When we talk about the war on drugs, it's important to highlight, I think, in, in the MEMSA community to, to remind ourselves of the disproportionality between the punishment of crack and cocaine crack and cocaine offenses, right? At one point, you had to have a hundred times more cocaine than crack to get the same prison sentence. Compare that now to how we deal with terror arrests in this country. The Huratri mili the militia in, in the middle of the country, <coughs> Michigan, that were targeting churches and abortion clinics were never labeled terrorists, and for the most part, got off very easy. Tariq Mahana, just last week, was sentenced to 17 years for translating documents. And we can disagree about his, his world view and whether or not the individual things he did were wrong or right, but comparing him to many of the militia leaders across the country, you again see the disproportionate targeting of people of color. So why? So why make the connection, right? Glenn Greenwald says that both separately and together, the war on drugs and the war on terror endlessly erode basic American civil liberties. By convincing a frightened public that they can stay safe, only if they cede more and more power to the state. Many of the civil liberties erosions from the war on terror have their genesis on the war on drugs. It's a drug war all over again. Same script, same faceless, ever morphing enemy. Some months it's Afghanistan, some months it's Iraq, some months it's Iran. Same lack of definable goals, and same detoured resources from real human needs. The drug war itself hasn't gone away. Many would argue that the war on terror is the cloned test tube baby of the war on drugs. In closing, both rely upon scary cartoon depictions of villains. The drug pin kingpin, the Mexican cartel, the terrorist mastermind, the, 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 Muslim, the Muslim who wants to blow everything up to keep the population in a state of heightened fear and thus blind them to rational discourse. And so I end with sort of the, the same the same urge to action, the same push to action that, that Monami, I think, really alluded to and that many have said throughout this conference is that we need to build power together. Black and brown communities, Muslim communities, need to realize the overlap in the way that we are being targeted. Because alone, we're all too small. Whether it's tackling the San Francisco Police Department, the New York Police Department, the FBI, or individual GPS tracking devices, it really is by building power together and across communities that we are going to be able to end one, the other, and both. Thank you.